This is Galignos, a small Greek island with a proud tradition. Here, men dive for sponges, risking and often losing their lives. Sponge diving is a vanishing occupation. This film is already history. Before World War II, over 100 sponge boats lined this wharf. Now, only 40 can be counted. Still, many older people are employed washing, cleaning, and softening the sponges brought back to Kalimnos by the far-ranging boats. Over the years, hundreds have been killed diving. Thousands more, like these, have been crippled by the bends. Modern diving techniques would all but eliminate these casualties. But a social system based on daring, death defiance, fate, and a great emphasis on masculinity prevents these men from adopting safe diving procedures. To do so would be an admission of fear, and this, above all, must be avoided. The sponge boats leave Kalimnos each year after Easter. Some cruise the Greek Aegean from island to island. Others fish the waters off the North African coast from Alexandria to Tunis. All the boats are away from their home for about half the year. Preparations for the trip include making the craft seaworthy each year. The boats are stripped, calked, and painted anew. Every piece of equipment is checked, from the antiquated helmets and air pumps still in use on a few boats after decades, down to the modern electronic depth finders carried by some of the boats. None of the boats, however, carries a two-way radio. When the boats leave Kalimnos, communication with land is almost severed for six months. Six months' worth of fuel and food staples are carried along. Stops in port are very rare, usually only for emergency repairs or for taking on fresh water. Divers must leave money behind for their families while they are at sea, and they get all of their salary in advance. The reason for this, the men say, is because they do not know if they'll live to collect their salaries at the end of the trip. Here, thousands of dollars change hands in coffee houses and in alleyways from the captains to the divers in these last hectic weeks before the boats leave. One last fling becomes the byword in the Kalimnian Tavern. The men finally gather on the docks to leave. The gay, lively atmosphere of the preceding night gives way to a benediction. (laughs) 
Everything is blessed. Men, boats, engines, air hoses, anything in short which, if it failed, could kill a man working 100 to 200 feet below the surface. Women made widows by previous trips, dressed in traditional black mourning clothes, are among those who come each year to the wharf to say goodbye to the fleet. without a father or a husband for half of every year. Some neighborhoods on Kalimnos appear as little enclaves of women, children, the old, and the infirm. These women live a life apart from the rest of the island. The merchants, the farmers, the shepherds, the fishermen who maintain their family integrity 12 months a year. These children do without a father for half of every year. Meanwhile, the men are also alone. The major fishing operations are in North Africa, four or five days away by small craft. Usually, the Greek Aegean is a peaceful place. The men play cards on the trip down, and when a man feels his luck would be better in a game on another boat, it is a simple matter to make the switch. Past the Isle of Crete, though, open seas are reached. Long experience in boat design has culminated in this Greek kaiki. It may bob like a cork, but it is almost unsinkable. When the boats reach the fishing grounds on the North African coast, six months of routine begins. Routine broken only by disasters and near disasters at frequent intervals. Work begins at dawn. The captain directs the boat to a likely spot and the first man dresses to go down. While one diver is below, the next dresses and prepares for work, and so on throughout the day until every man has made at least three dives, or until darkness stops the operation. Crossing himself, and with total disregard for safety, he ignores the ladder and leaps into the water. The divers like these work in water 120 feet deep and more, using antiquated machinery and masks. Lead weights have been adopted for extra balance in heavy currents. Still, the age-old system of descending to the ocean floor with a chunk of marble is maintained. The marble is attached by a line to the diver's wrist, 
so that he may be hauled up from the bottom when his dive is over. Sponge fishing is almost a hereditary occupation. This 18-year-old is on his first trip as a diver. He learned to be a diver by going to sea as a deckhand for a year with an uncle who owns a boat and by watching the other divers. He has several uncles, cousins, and brothers who are currently sponge fishermen. Not many young men are going with the little boats these days. Times have changed. People buy synthetic sponges now, and soon this may be an industry of old men. Meanwhile, this young man still considers wearing shoes to protect his feet from sharp coral to be somehow shameful. While one man tends the hose, another diver watches an hourglass to make sure his buddy does not stay down too long. With each turn of the hourglass, he chants the time out loud so the lifeline tender can signal the man below when it is time to come up. The helmsman follows the bubbles as the diver walks along the bottom in search of sponge. And the wire cage around the propeller stands as a grim reminder of the dangers of this profession. In a recent season alone, nine men were crippled and six more died of bends and air embolism. The bottom is a lonely world, rich, full of beauty, and full of danger. Sharks and stingrays are part of this undersea world of danger, but the real danger is in unsafe diving practices. This young man is now on his third dive of the day. Each dive has been approximately 25 minutes in length in about 120 feet of water. All three dives were done in the space of about eight hours. U.S. Navy diving tables suggest a minimum of 32 minutes for ascent to avoid bends. But this young man will be brought up in four minutes, so the next diver will not lose any time getting to the bottom. This is certainly courting death. But that is the chance you have to take when you are an Andres, a man, a Colombian diver. These men are professionals. They know the chances they are taking. Why then do they do it? As with most seemingly irrational things, this death-defying behavior finds its own logic in the total framework of the culture. By taking their money in advance, the men go into debt to the captain, a debt of honor which can be abolished only by large sponge catches. And such catches force the men to make three dives a day at least. If they came up slowly, they could not produce as many sponges, and then they would have to accept lower wages. But a sponge diver earns two and a half times in six months what a laborer earns in a year. There has to be some compensation for enduring the hardships of half a year at sea on a 10 meter craft. The diver has found some sponge, but not many, and the captain decides to move on to another spot where pickings may not be so lean. 
The boat moves down the coast a mile or so, and the next man gets ready to jump into the sea. This time, the depth is 150 feet, and the first diver sits down for three hours until it is his turn to dive again. Some boats working in what Kalimnians call deep waters, over 180 feet, have 12 divers and five crew members. But conditions are crowded enough here. 12 men live and work for six months on this little craft. And so it goes, day after day, week after week, month after month, diver following diver in this virile, crowded, but lonely world. As the sponges are brought in, they're strung on lines, washed in the ocean, then crushed by bare feet to kill and remove the black skin and turn the animal into the familiar fleecy sponge. The sponges are then processed, dried, and hung on lines for later marketing when the boats return to Kalimnos.
At sundown, the men return to eat their one meal a day on the mothership, which carries the fuel and food for the expedition. One meal a day. But these men believe that eating can cause a diver to get the bends, and it would not be right for the other crew members to taunt the divers by eating in front of them. The greatest hazard to efficiency on these boats is not the danger of bends. It is the demoralization periods that plague every boat when the psychology of close living and long after